Welcome to Conditional Probability. This is a video lesson for probability and statistics. Loosely speaking, a conditional probability is the probability of an event measured relative to some other event that is treated no differently than a sample space. We will begin our study of conditional probability through an example. However, we'll provide a rigorous definition for this concept shortly afterward. Consider this scenario. Out of 97 athletes who participate in sports at a high school, 31 practice daily, 40 excel in their sport, and 58 practice daily or excel in their sport. We're going to let A describe the event in which the athlete practices daily, and B describe the event in which the athlete excels in his or her sport. The following data is available concerning the relationships between these events. Now, all of this data is going to be expressed as cardinality because that's the way it was given to us. But we're ultimately going to convert it to probability using the classical interpretation. We know there's 97 athletes attending the high school, and so we can convert our cardinalities to probabilities simply by dividing them by 97. Anyway, the cardinality of A is 31, the cardinality of B is 40, and the cardinality of A union B is 58. So we're going to find the cardinality of A intersect B, or really its, its probability, first. So the probability that an athlete practices daily and excels in his or her sport is the probability of A intersect B, which we can rewrite in terms of a union using the general addition rule. Probability of A plus probability of B minus the probability of the union. We know those quantities simply by taking our given cardinalities and dividing them by 97. Plug those results into the general addition formula and that will give us the probability of A intersect B. It's 13 over 97. If I wanted to label the intersection with its cardinality rather than its probability, I would simply drop the denominator of 97 and label the intersection with 13. We'll continue labeling the independent sectors of the Venn diagram, and we'll work next with A but not B. The probability of A but not B is equal to the probability of A minus the probability of A intersect B. We know both of those quantities, so when we plug them in, we find that the probability of A but not B is just 18 over 97. If I wanted to label that sector of the Venn diagram with simply the cardinality, once again, I would just drop the denominator of 97. At that point, I'd label A but not B with just its cardinality of 18. Similarly, we can label the other exclusive part of the Venn diagram, B but not A, with its cardinality by working through probabilities again. Probability of B but not A is equal to the probability of B minus the probability of the intersection. So 40 over 97 minus 13 over 97 gives us a probability of 27 over 97 for the probability of B but not A. If I want to label it as a cardinality, I drop the denominator of 97. 27 goes into B but not A. Lastly, we're left with needing to label the probability of the event neither A nor B. And this is just the complement of the union of A and B. Well, the probability of the union of A and B is just 1 minus the probability of the union. And we already know the probability of the union. It's 58 over 97. So 1 minus that is 39 over 97, giving us the probability of A union B complement. If we want to convert that back to a cardinality, we simply drop the denominator. So we label A union B complement in the Venn diagram with simply 39. This completes our Venn diagram, and it puts us in a position where, of course, as we've done before, we could start answering questions about just about any compound event that we could imagine. But we're going to start asking a new kind of question. We're going to introduce the idea of a conditional probability. So let's consider this question. It's a little different from many of the questions we've asked about probabilities of compound events in the past. What is the probability that an athlete who excels in his or her sport is an athlete who practices daily? This is something totally new. It is not the same as asking for the probability of A and B. It turns out 
the probability of this event will be 13 over 40. But why? What we've stumbled upon here is something called conditional probability. It is no longer a question whether the athlete excels or B. We've assumed that to be true about them. The only event in question is if the athlete practices daily, which is A. B is a condition on A. We are essentially asking, what is the probability of A given that we know B to be true? In the final part of the previous example, we realized we were not justified in counting the number of athletes who practice and excel, and then simply dividing this number by the number of athletes in our sample space. We had to restrict our attention to the athletes whom we knew excelled, or those in the event B. Therefore, to compute the probability of this event, we must take the number of athletes in A intersect B and divide this by the number of athletes in our restriction in B. This gives us 13 over 40. Note that this is equivalent to computing the probability of A intersect B divided by the probability of B. And this gives rise to our next definition. So this is the definition of conditional probability. We let A and B be two events from the same sample space. The conditional probability of A given B is defined in terms of the following notation and formula. The probability of A given B equals the probability of A intersect B divided by the probability of B. So the symbol probability of A bar B is actually read the probability of A given B. And it's a conditional probability. Well, it turns out that the definition of conditional probability can be restated in an alternative but equivalent form, and we're going to state it in, a, in, in the form of a theorem. It's a little bit overblown, but um, it's something that we can prove, so we might as well. And so this, is, this theorem is called the general multiplication formula, and it says that the probability of the intersection of A and B is equal to probability of A given B times B. To prove the general multiplication formula, we just need to recognize that it follows directly from multiplying both sides of the definition of conditional probability by its denominator, P of B. And then through some cancellation, we obtain the probability of A intersect B equals the probability of A given B times B. Well, with the definition of conditional probability in place, we'll explore it with some examples. So let's Imagine that we can estimate that 47% of the residents of a certain city purchase goods over the internet, and 63% purchase goods by traveling to a big box store. We're also going to estimate that 83% purchase goods over the internet or by traveling to a big box store. So we'll begin by summarizing the elementary events in our system with the following notation. We'll let I represent the event that a resident purchases goods over the internet. We'll let B represent the event that a resident purchases goods from a big box store. Then, in terms of this notation, we can recognize that the following data is available concerning the relationships between these events. P of I is 47%, P of B is 63%, and P of I union B is equal to 83%. We'll follow our usual strategy of attempting to complete our Venn diagram's labels by finding the probability of I intersect B first. We already know the probability of the union of I or B, so we'll determine the intersection with the aid of the general addition formula as usual. We know that probability of I intersect B equals the probability of I plus the probability of B minus the probability of I union B. The probabilities on the right-hand side of this addition formula are all known to us, so we substitute them in as 0.47 plus 0.63 minus 0.83, which results in a value of 0.27 for the probability of I intersect B. We label the intersection sector of our Venn diagram with that value. So now we'll proceed to find the probabilities of the relative complements of I but not B, and then later B but not I. Using the relative complement formula for the probability of I but not B, we see that that probability has a value of 0 0.20. We label the exclusive part of I in the Venn diagram with that value. Likewise, the probability of B but not I has a value of 0 
and we labeled the exclusive part of B in the Venn diagram with that value. The remaining sector in the Venn diagram represents the event of neither I nor B, which is the complement of I union B. We know the probability of I union B, so it's the complement of I union B is just 1 minus the union. We plug known values into that formula to find that the probability of neither I nor B is just 0.17. We label the exterior of the I and B circles with that value. At this point, we have a completed Venn diagram, and we already know how powerful completed Venn diagrams can be when it comes to computing the probabilities of compound events. However, in this example, we're going to see that they are just as powerful for computing conditional probabilities. And the reason for that is that if we think back to the definition of conditional probability, it's expressed in terms of compound events. So those compound events will compute using the Venn diagram, then we'll plug their probabilities into the conditional probability formula in order to arrive at a result. For example, we might ask, what is the probability someone who purchases goods over the internet purchases goods from a big box store? So we're assuming that we know they've purchased goods over the internet. That's our condition. So what we're trying to compute is the probability of B given I. Definition of conditional probability tells us that's the probability of B intersect I divided by I. And that's great news because we can read the values for the probabilities that appear in both the numerator and denominator directly from our completed Venn diagram. They are 0.27 and 0.47 respectively. So 0.27 divided by 0.47 is approximately 0.574. That's the probability of B given I. For another example, we might ask, what is the probability someone who does not purchase goods from a big box store purchases goods over the internet? So here we're assuming that this person does not purchase goods from the big box store. That's our condition. It's our given. We're asking whether or not they purchase goods over the internet. So the probability in question, the conditional probability in question here, is the probability of I given B complement. If we apply the definition of conditional probability, that results in probability of I intersect B complement divided by the probability of B complement. The numerator may be rewritten as probability of I but not B. And now both the numerator and denominator can be found by inspecting the Venn diagram. I but not B is the exclusive part of I, that's 0.20. Not B is everything outside of the B circle, and that's simply 0.20 plus 0.17. So when we compute 0.20 over the quantity 0.20 plus 0.17, we arrive at the value of the probability of I given B complement, which is 0.541 approximately. We've already seen how compound events need not be relationships between just two events. They could involve three or more elementary events. Well, conditional probabilities also need not be relationships between just two events. And in fact, they need not involve only elementary events. So we'll see this in the next example. We'll imagine that at a robotics research and development facility, active projects are receiving funding to support the acquisition of hardware, which we'll denote by the event H, salary for personnel, which we'll denote by the event S, and the rental of computational time on cloud-based high-performance computing cluster, which we'll denote by the event C. So let's imagine the following data are available concerning the relationships between these given elementary events. Probability of H is 0.5, the probability of S is 0.53. The probability of C is 0.61. The probability of H given S is 0.5849. The probability of S but not C is 0.1900. The probability of H complement given C complement is 0.3590. And the probability of H and S and C is 0.19. So we'll try to take this information and use it to determine the intersections uh, between the elementary events 
and then label those intersections on our Venn diagram first. And we'll start with the given three-way intersection, probability of H intersect S intersect C equals 0.19. That occupies the central label on our Venn diagram. We'll use the general multiplication formula to find the probability of H intersect S from our given value of probability of H given S. So probability of H intersect S is equal to the probability of H given S times the probability of S. We know values for the two probabilities on the right-hand side of this formula. So when we substitute them in, we obtain the probability of H intersect S equals 0 0.5849 times 0 0.53, which is approximately equal to 0 0.31. This tells us that the total probability in the intersection between H and S should be 0.31. We've already allocated 19% to the triple intersection, so the leftover part of that intersection must be occupied by 0 0.12. Next, we'll use the relative complement formula to find the probability of S intersect C from the given value of S but not C. We know that the probability of S intersect C equals the probability of S minus the probability of S but not C. The values on the right-hand side of that formula are known to us, and when we substitute them in, we find that the probability of S intersect C is equal to 0.53 minus 0.19, or 0 0.34. And again, this is the probability of the entire intersection between S and C, but we've already allocated 19% of that probability to the three-way intersection of H and S and C. So what's left over is 15% or 0 0.15 to be allocated to the intersection of S and C that does not overlap with H. So we label that part of our Venn diagram. We have one intersection to go. We'd like to find the probability of H intersect C. To find it, we'll relate it to the conditional probability P of H complement given C complement but we're going to need to rewrite that conditional probability using its definition. So the probability of H complement given C complement is equal to the probability of H complement and C complement divided by the probability of C complement. Now those probabilities aren't all known directly. We've got to rethink what some of them mean. We can rewrite the probability of H complement and C complement using De Morgan's formula to obtain the probability of H or C complement, or the probability of H union C complement. Well, both our numerator and denominator are complements, so we'll rewrite them using the complement formula. This results in a probability of H complement given C complement is equal to 1 minus the probability of H union C over the quantity 1 minus probability of C. That's still not entirely useful, though, because we want an intersection. We have no intersection appearing in our formula yet. However, by now we've had a fair amount of experience exchanging unions for intersections and vice versa using the general addition formula. So we'll replace the probability of H union C with the probability of H plus the probability of C minus the probability of H intersect C. And we'll subtract all of that, distributing negative signs as appropriate, from 1 in order to obtain the new numerator of 1 minus the probability of H minus the probability of C plus the probability of H intersect C. At this point, we've got a formula that involves the unknown intersection that we want and then a bunch of other probabilities that we know, that we have data for. So it becomes a problem of using algebra to rearrange that expression, that equation, for the unknown probability of H intersect C. And if we carry out the necessary algebraic steps for doing that, we should find that the probability of H intersect C is equal to the probability of H complement given C complement times the quantity of 1 minus the probability of C minus 1 plus the probability of H plus the probability of C. 
the probabilities on the right hand side of that equation are all known to us. So if we substitute them in, we find that the probability of h intersects c is equal to the quantity of 0 0.3590 times 0 0.39 minus 1 plus 0 0.5 plus 0 0.61. This results in a value of 0 0.25, which represents the probability of the entire intersection h and c. But remember, we've already allocated 19% of that probability to the three-way intersection H and C and S. So what we have left over for the part of H intersects C that doesn't overlap with S is just 0.06 or 6%. We label our Venn diagram accordingly. Well, now we'll go about completing the remaining sectors of the Venn diagram. We know that the probability of the entire event H is 0.5. But we've already allocated 0 0.12, 0 0.19, and 0 0.06 to the various sectors of H that overlap with S and or C. So that uses up 37% of that 50% probability. 13% is remaining for the sector of H that represents only H, H at the exclusion of the other events. So we label the exclusive part of H in our Venn diagram with a value of 0.13. We can calculate the probability of only S in the same way. We know that the probability of all of S is 0.53, but if we remove the parts of S that we've already allocated, or 0 0.12, 0 0.19, and 0.15 from it, we see that there's 7% or 0 0.07 remaining for the exclusive part of S, for the probability of only S. We label that part of the Venn diagram accordingly. The same approach works very well for finding the probability of only C, or the exclusive part of C. We know that the probability of all of C is 0.61 from our given information, and if we remove the parts of C that we've already allocated, 0 0.06, 0 0.19, and 0.15, that leaves us a remaining value of 0.21 to allocate to the sector representing C exclusively. So we label that part of the Venn diagram accordingly. At this point, the only unallocated sector of the Venn diagram is the one that represents neither H nor S nor C. We can equivalently think of this as the exterior of the H or S or C circles, and that is just the probability of the complement of H union S union C. To find it, we simply add up all of the probability that we've allocated to the interior of the H or S or C circles so far, and subtract that from one, subtract it from total probability. If we do that, we'll find that there's only 7% or 0.07 remaining to allocate to the sector that represents neither H nor S nor C. We label our Venn diagram with that accordingly, and at this point we've got a completed Venn diagram, which, as we know, can be used to efficiently compute various compound events, and as we've seen more recently, also some conditional probabilities. For instance, we might want to compute the probability a project that is funded for the acquisition of hardware is not funded for salary. So we're assuming that the project is funded for the acquisition of hardware. That's our given. We're asking what's the probability that it's not funded for salary. So we're, we're wanting to know the probability of S complement given H. The definition of conditional probability tells us that this is the probability of S complement and H divided by the probability of H. We can rewrite the numerator as the probability of H but not S. This is the shaded region in our Venn diagram and we can see that it has a net probability of 0.13 plus 0.06 or 0.19. That'll be the value of our numerator. The denominator, or P of H, is represented by the shaded region in the Venn diagram, and its probability is just the sum of the individual probabilities found within it. We already know that those sum to 0.5. 
So if we substitute these probabilities for the numerator and denominator in our formula, we'll find that the probability of S complement given H equals 0.19 divided by 0.5, which results in 0.38. This is the probability that a project that is funded for the acquisition of hardware is not funded for salary. Let's consider another example where we'll compute the probability that a project that is funded for neither salary nor computational time is funded for hardware acquisition. So we're assuming that the project is funded for neither salary nor computational time. That means not S and not C is our given event. The event in question is whether or not the project is funded for hardware acquisition. That's H. So what we're trying to compute is the probability of H given S complement intersect C complement. If we apply the definition of conditional probability to that conditional event, we'll obtain the probability of H intersect S complement intersect C complement divided by the probability of S complement intersect C complement. So those are just two compound events, and we'll want to recognize them from our Venn diagram. The numerator, or the probability of H and not S and not C, is just the part of H that does not overlap with S or C. It's the exclusive part of H. By inspection, we can see that that has a value of 0.13. So 0.13 will be our numerator in this expression. The denominator, or not S and not C, can be recognized to be equivalent to the complement of S union C by applying De Morgan's law. Well, the complement of S union C is simply everything outside of the S or C circles in our diagram. And that's the 0.13 in the exclusive part of H and the 0.07 outside of S or H or C. So together, that provides us with a value of 0 0.20 for the denominator in our expression. If we actually substitute those values in for the numerator and denominator of our expression, we'll see that the probability of H given not S and not C is 0.13 over 0 0.20, which results in a value of 0.65. Well, now we can look at another one that's a little more challenging. We'll compute the probability a project that is not funded for hardware acquisition is funded for salary or not com computational time. So our assumption, our given, is that the project is not funded for hardware acquisition. The event in question is whether or not the project is funded for salary or not computational time. S union C complement. In other words, we're hoping to compute the conditional probability, probability of S union C complement given H complement. And we can do so by applying the definition of conditional probability to rewrite this as the probability of S union C complement intersect H complement divided by the probability of H complement. Our approach to finding this conditional probability is going to involve simply identifying the probabilities of the compound events appearing on the right-hand side of our formula from the Venn diagram. This just requires a little extra work. We'll begin with the numerator. Part of the numerator is S union C complement. So S is the shaded region on the Venn diagram we're seeing right now. we'd like to form the union of S with C complement, and C complement is the shaded region that's displayed right now. S union C complement can be identified in our Venn diagram by appealing to the definition of union. It's everything in S, everything in C complement, or perhaps both. And that is the shaded region depicted right now. So, in order to determine the probability in the numerator of our formula, we have to think about how we'll take 
the event S union C complement and intersect it with H complement. H complement is depicted now, but we want to see what both events have in common. And so that is the gray shaded region that is displayed on the screen currently. We can compute its probability simply by summing the probabilities of the three independent sectors that appear within that gray shaded region. These are 0 0.07, 0 0.15, and 0 0.07. Those give us a total of 0.29 for the probability of S union C complement intersect H complement. That forms the numerator of our expression. Now the probability in the denominator is just the probability of H complement. We already know that the probability of H is 0.5, so the probability of H complement in the denominator is also 0.5. Now that we know that the numerator and denominator of our expression are 0.29 and 0.5 respectively, we can substitute them in to find that the probability of S union C complement given H complement is 0.29 over 0.5, which results in 0.58. We'll look at one more example that illustrates an alternate way of organizing data called a contingency table that can be particularly useful when working with conditional probabilities. An artificial intelligence researcher has trained an image classifier to detect digital images of cats in an Instagram feed. She tests the classifier against a collection of images of which 1,340 display a cat and the remaining 1,160 do not. Her classifier correctly identifies 1,298 of the cat images but misclassifies the remaining 42 as non-cat images. Similarly, it correctly identifies 1,121 of the non-cat images, but misclassifies the remaining 39 as cats. She summarizes these results in the following contingency table. She summarizes the notation C sub A to represent the event that an image actually depicts a cat. Similarly, C sub C represents the event that an image was classified as a depiction of a cat. Next, she estimates the probability of several conditional events. P of C sub C given C sub A and P of C sub C complement given C sub A complement are just the probabilities of correctly classifying a cat image and correctly classifying a non-cat image. In order to determine the probability of C sub C given C sub A, which represents the probability an image which is actually of a cat was classified to be an image of a cat, she needs to find the number of images which are actually of cats and were classified as cats. There are 1,298 of them from the contingency table. That forms her numerator. And she's going to divide that by the total number of images which are actually of cats. Again, the contingency table tells her that there are 1,340 of those. So the probability of C sub C given C sub A is just 1,298 divided by 1,340, or roughly 0 0.9687. She can perform a similar analysis to determine the probability of C sub C complement given C sub A complement. This involves counting up the number of images that are actually not of cats and were classified as not being of cats. Contingency table tells us that there were 1,121 such images. And we divide this count by the total number of images that were actually not of cats. There were 1,160 of them. So 1,121 divided by 1,160 comes out to be about 0 0.9664. This is our result for the probability of C sub C complement given C sub A complement. 
These two probabilities can be thought of the probabilities of a true positive detection of an actual cat and a true negative or detection of an actual non-cat. P of C sub C given C sub A complement and C sub C complement given C sub A are the probabilities of incorrectly classifying an actual non-cat image as a cat or incorrectly classifying an actual cat image as a non-cat. So these are the probabilities of making classification errors. P of C sub C given C sub A can be obtained by counting up the number of images which are not actual cat images but were classified as cat images. The contingency table tells us that there were 39 such images. Then we divide those by the number of actual non-cat images. There's a 1,160 of them. 39 over 1,160 gives us 0 0.0336, which is just over 3%. Likewise, if we want to calculate the probability of C sub C complement given C sub A, we've got to count up the number of images that are actual cat images, but were classified as non-cat images. The contingency ta table tells us that there were 42 such misclassifications. Then we're going to divide that by the number the total number of actual cat images and again the contingency table tells us there are 1,340 of those. So 42 divided by 1,340 is about 0 0.0313 or again just over 3 percent. These probabilities of various misclassifications can be thought of respectively as the probability of incurring a false positive and a false negative. They're also referred to as the probabilities of type 1 and type 2 errors, respectively. In order to test the accuracy of her classifier, which is just the probability of obtaining a correct classification, we can do this computation by dividing the total number of correct classifications by the total number of images. From the contingency table, we find that this is 1,298 plus 1,121. Those are the two different counts of the two different types of correct classifications. And we'll divide that by the total number of images, or 2,500. This results in a value of 0 0.9676. So, in some sense, we've got a 96.76% accuracy associated with this cat image classifier. Our researcher is also interested in two more conditional probabilities. These are the probability of C sub A given C sub C and the probability of C sub A complement given C sub C complement. These represent something different than what we've looked at so far. They're the probabilities that an image which we know to be classified as a cat actually represented a cat, and that an image classified as a non-cat actually represented a non-cat. So she obtains these probabilities once again by appealing to the definition of conditional probability. P of C of A given C sub C is equal to the probability of C sub A intersects C sub C divided by the probability of C sub C. And so she simply counts up the number of images which are actual CAD images and classified as CAD images. There are 1,298 of those and divides that by the total number of images that were classified as CATs, 1,337. That gives her a probability of 0 0.9701 for C sub A given C sub C. And in a very similar approach to determine the probability of C sub A complement given C sub C complement, we need to figure out the number of images that are not actually cats and they were 
classified as being not actually cats. There are 1,121 such images. And we're going to divide that by the total number of images that were not classified as cats. There's a 1,163. So 1,121 divided by 1,163 comes out to be 0 0.9638. In the last example, the essence of what we saw was a cat detector that performed reasonably well on a set of images that consisted of a fairly even split of actual cat and actual non-cat images. Our next example explores some of the pitfalls that surround the situation where the test attempts to identify an extremely rare condition among a large number of examples. Imagine a degenerative genetic disorder with symptoms that don't present themselves in humans until adulthood. These symptoms include loss of motor control, dementia, and seizures. Premature death occurs in most individuals with the disorder. There is a treatment that will hold the symptoms at bay and return lifespan in the patients to normal, but it, it's, it's expensive and there are a series of unpleasant side effects. A medical research lab has recently developed a test that diagnoses the disorder and they claim it has a high accuracy. Specifically, the probabilities of a true positive and a true negative are 0.9937 and 0.9912. On the surface, this should sound great. Upon hearing about this new test, the U.S. President begins to call for the universal administration of the test to all citizens of ages 24 and younger. She hopes to catch as many cases as possible before they become symptomatic so that they can avoid the symptoms of the syndrome. The president's public health advisor strongly recommends against this course of action. She first makes the point that the syndrome is extremely rare. Of the 186,988,109 Americans in this age group, it is expected that there are only 935 with the syndrome. With this, in the 0.9937 true positive probability advertised for the test in mind, she expects that the test correctly diagnoses a sick 929 people who actually have the syndrome. Similarly, with the test's true negative probability of 0.9912 in mind, she argues that the test should also correctly diagnose as healthy 185,341,693 people who are actually healthy. However, where the trouble starts is when she analyzes the type 1 and type 2 errors of the test. She lets D represent the event that a test subject is diagnosed with the syndrome and S represent the event that a subject actually has the syndrome. She summarizes the data she has so far as well as the head counts related to the numbers of type 1 and type 2 errors in a contingency table. The contingency table is organized in two rows and two columns with an additional total column and an additional total roll. The rows are representing whether a patient actually has the syndrome or does not have the syndrome, S and S complement. The columns are organized into the events of whether the patient was diagnosed with the syndrome or not diagnosed with the syndrome, D and D complement. So we can see that the D column has an entry of 929 in the S row and 1,645,487 in the S complement row. And the D complement column has six patients in the S row and 185,341,687 in the S complement row. And the remaining entries in the contingency table just represent the row or column sums. So the type 2 error count isn't that bad. Out of 935 subjects who actually have the syndrome, S, we expect that only 6 will be misdiagnosed as healthy. 
with a type 1 error probability of p of d complement given s equals 1 minus 0 0.9937 equal to 0 0.0063, this probably isn't terribly surprising. However, the type 1 error count exposes the real problem with administering a test for a rare disease to a large population. This test misclassifies over 1.6 million healthy people as sick. This is the 1,645,487 people that appear in the S complement row of the D column. This might seem a little surprising and counterintuitive since the type 1 error rate is low. After all, P of D given S complement equals 1 minus 0 0.9912 equals 0 0.0088. The way to make this apparent paradox more intuitive is to realize that although the test has a low probability of producing a misdiagnosis of the syndrome among a healthy population, it has been applied to a very large population of almost 187 million people. Even though 0.88% is a small percentage of that population, it still amounts to a large number of people in absolute terms, about 1.6 million. This is unfortunate because we would be effectively condemning about 1.6 million people to treatment with a expensive drug that has some unpleasant side effects for the rest of their lives, and it would be totally unnecessary. They're already healthy. Another way of seeing what is at work here is to consider a thought experiment. Instead of administering the new test, suppose you just noted that this disease is rare. If we only expect that there are 935 people with the syndrome in a population of 186,988,109, then the probability that any given person in that population has the syndrome is P of S is approximately equal to the ratio of these two numbers, or 0 0.000005. Suppose we just randomly selected 935 people from the population and declared that they had the syndrome as an alternative to performing our fancy new medical diagnostic test. We would expect that there would be P of S times 935 or 0 0.000005 times 935. It's approximately equal to 0 0.00468 people in this group who actually have the syndrome. Effectively, this is none of them, so this approach has admittedly increased the number of type 2 errors from 6 to 935. However, it has reduced the number of type 1 errors from over 1.6 million to 0. This approach of randomly guessing at who in the population is sick and who is not then dramatically outperforms our medical diagnostic test in terms of the number of type 1 errors that it commits. There's some benefit to this considering the economic and social cost of condemning those 1.6 million people to a life of an unnecessary medical treatment that has unpleasant side effects. So to summarize, what we're really doing in this thought experiment is weighing the cost of making over 1.6 million type 1 errors by applying the new medical diagnostic test universally to a large population of people against the cost of making about 935 type 2 errors by simply randomly guessing at who in the population is actually sick. Such a high number of type 1 errors in the scenario of universal testing would have a range of negative consequences. This large set of people would all be subjected to the stress of believing they had a dangerous and painful disorder when none of them do in reality. They might commit to a lifelong regime of costly medical treatments with uncomfortable side effects. These would serve no actual health benefits. The economic, physiological, and psychological costs could be staggering for each of these 1.6 million people. On top of that, there is the cost of administering the test itself. 
In many ways, it's not hard to argue that we'd be better off testing by randomly selecting 935 people and declaring them sick. This completely avoids the costs associated with the test itself and with the large number of type 1 errors. The only cost it incurs is the 935 type 2 errors. However, these people, who were misdiagnosed as healthy when they actually had the syndrome, could still be tested as symptoms started to present themselves and they could still be treated after testing positive. The last example might cause some mistrust in the diagnostic process in general, but this is not its intent. The problem is when a universal testing program is implemented in order to detect an extremely rare condition with an extremely large population. However, there are ways to get around this problem. Perhaps the most important is to seek ways to narrow the focus of the test to a much smaller population in which the condition is more likely to manifest itself. We'll explore how this might help in our final example. In the last example, we saw a diagnostic test that determined if a subject had a rare and debilitating syndrome. The test correctly diagnoses people who have the syndrome as sick with a probability of P of D given S equals 0.9937, and it correctly diagnoses people who do not have the syndrome as healthy with a probability of P a D complement given S complement equals 0.9912. We also saw that the probability that somebody actually has the syndrome in general is 0.000005. It's an extremely rare disease. Suppose we know some demographic information about the prevalence of the syndrome among groups of people who have a family history of the syndrome denoted by the event H and or are experiencing symptoms of the syndrome denoted by the event E. Then suppose we know the following data. The number of people who actually have the syndrome was given in the previous example. Cardinality of S equals 935. But we're going to assume that the number of people who have a family history of the syndrome is cardinality of H equals 13,843. Likewise, we'll assume the number of people who are experiencing symptoms of the syndrome is cardinality of E equals 21,436. Further, we're going to assume that the number of people who have a family history and are experiencing symptoms of the syndrome is H intersect E equals 1,020. We'll assume that the probability someone who has a family history of the syndrome actually has a syndrome is P of S given H equal to 0 0.066. We'll assume the probability someone who is experiencing symptoms actually has the syndrome is P of S given E or 0 0.042. Finally, We'll assume that the probability someone who has a family history of the syndrome and is experiencing symptoms actually has the syndrome is S, given H intersect E, has a probability of 0 0.864. Now, this is all made up data, but it's demographic data that we could have measured were this a real scenario. It suggests that the group of people who have a family history of the syndrome and are experiencing symptoms would be a good group to restrict our diagnostic testing to. To see why, we'll estimate the numbers of type 1 and type 2 errors this strategy would incur. To do so, let's form a new contingency table that summarizes how the 1,020 people in H intersect E are diagnosed. To do this, we'll need to know how many of these people are sick and how many are not. Now we know that probability of S given H intersect E is equal to 0 0.864. Therefore, probability of S intersect H intersect E equals the probability of S given H intersect E times the probability of H intersect E. This is just the general multiplication formula. Therefore, we should expect that the cardinality of S intersect H intersect E equals the probability of S given H intersect E times the cardinality of H intersect E. This is 0 0.864 times 1020, or approximately 881. 
In other words, we'd expect that there ought to be about 881 people with the syndrome among the 1,020 people who have a family history and are experiencing symptoms. Consequently, there are 1,020 minus 881 equals 139 people in this group who do not have the syndrome. Now, since P of D given S equals 0 0.9937, we expect our test to produce a correct diagnosis of the syndrome 0 0.9937 times 881 equals 875 times among the 881 people in this group who actually have the syndrome. This means that we have committed 881 minus 875 equals 6 type 2 errors within our group. Likewise, since P of D complement given S complement equals 0.9912, we expect our test to produce a correct diagnosis of health 0.9912 times 139 equals 138 times among the 139 healthy people in the group. This means we've only committed 139 minus 138 equals one type one error within our group. We'll summarize these results in a new contingency table. Our contingency table still has two rows and two columns. The rows represent the people who have the syndrome and don't within the high risk group and the two columns represent the numbers of people who were diagnosed as having the sim syndrome and not diagnosed as having the syndrome within the high risk group. Of the people who have the syndrome, 875 were diagnosed with the syndrome and six were not. Of the people who do not have the syndrome, one was diagnosed as having the syndrome and 138 were not. Now we haven't completely accounted for all of the type one and type two errors that we've effectively incurred through this testing program to see why it isn't a bad idea to summarize the data we have so far. Since we've assumed that there are 935 people in the entire population who have the syndrome, we have failed to test all people with the syndrome by restricting our attention to H intersect E. There are 935 minus 881 equals 54 people with the syndrome who went untested. Therefore, they're undiagnosed. This brings the number of people who have the syndrome but were not diagnosed with it to 54 plus 6 equals 60. That's our total number of type 2 errors. The number of healthy people who were incorrectly diagnosed as having the syndrome remains unchanged at 1. This is the only type 1 error committed by this approach. Now recall the errors we committed in the previous example. When blindly applying the test to the entire population of 186,988,109 people of ages 24 or younger, we saw 1.6 million type 1 errors and 6 type 2 errors. When simply selecting 935 people at random and declaring them sick, we committed no type 1 errors and 935 type 2 errors. Our approach from this example is a reasonable compromise between the two extreme approaches we described in the previous example. It reduces the large number of type 1 errors incurred by the universal testing strategy from 1.6 million to just one. It also reduces the 935 type 2 errors associated with the strategy of randomly declaring 935 people to be sick to just 60. Therefore, this testing strategy keeps both the type 1 and type 2 errors reasonably well under control. By any measure, this seems like a better way to go. Well, we've arrived at the end of our video lesson on conditional probability. I hope you found it helpful and hope you'll be able to join us for the next video lesson. Thanks for watching.